When solving the Basel problem, Euler used a formula for the sign as an infinite product. He justified this as for polynomials, it is always possible to write them as a product involving their zeros. However, some zeros can be in the complex numbers. So it's natural to interpret polynomials as a function from the complex numbers to the complex numbers. Now sine is kinda a polynomial of infinite degree, as there is a representation by a power series. So, similar to polynomials, there should be a factorization involving the zeros. Here the zeros are all the integers multiples of pi. But are we really justified to do so, and do similar product expansion exist for all power series? We may also be interested in the question whether for any subset in the complex numbers, there is some power series, which has zeros exactly in this set. Before we can address these questions, we must understand what it means for an infinite product to converge. For finite products, the product is zero if and only if one of its factors is zero. This is a really useful property, so does it also hold for infinite products? We can easily find counterexamples for this. For example, if one multiplies one half over and over again. But there are also examples which are not so easy to see. For instance, this product is zero, although the terms tend to one. To restore this property, we're going to say that an infinite product is convergent if almost all factors are non-zero and the product over all non-zero factors is non-zero. With this definition, we are again able to say that if a convergent product is zero, then one of its factors must be zero. Let's go back to our power series. The simplest case is if the power series converges everywhere. Functions on the complex numbers which can be represented by such a power series are called entire. For examples, polynomials are entire. Entire functions, which are not polynomials, are called transcendental. These include functions like the exponential function and the sine. When trying to factor entire functions with their zeros, we need to know if a function is given uniquely by its zeros. In case of polynomials, if two polynomials have the same roots, they only differ by a constant. Is there an analogous statement for entire functions? As there are non-constant entire functions without any zeros, the obvious analog does not hold. Instead, we have that if two entire functions have the same zeros, then they differ by an exponential factor. For polynomials, the zero set is always finite, so how does it behave for entire functions? Here the zero set is always discrete, so there are no accumulation points. This is a consequence of a theorem known as the identity theorem. As the zero set is discrete, we can list all the zeros in order of their magnitude. We can now try to form a product with the zeros. Unfortunately, this product does generally not converge. We can fix this by adding extra factors, which don't add any zeros which enforce convergence. Let's look at what factors we might want to add. As we don't want any additional zeros, we add exponential factors. Since the zeros are unbounded, for any z, quotient converges to zero as n tends to infinity. In the products, the extra factors should ensure convergence by pushing the factor closer to one. When we look at the Taylor series of the logarithm, we could add the first few terms of the Taylor series to the logarithm. By potentiating this, we get these factors. We call them elementary factors. When we plot the first few elementary factors, we see that for small z, the elementary factor stays close to one. So when we have an infinite product of elementary factors, this ensures that eventually we will always multiply with terms very close to one. This makes the product converge. Explicitly, we can express this in this inequality. Now we are ready to state the Weierstrass factorization theorem. It says that for an entire function, we can choose high enough numbers for the orders of the elementary factors, such that the product converges. Then f is given by this formula. When we can restrict how fast the number of zeros with a given magnitude is growing, we can say even more. Jensen's formula links the average behavior of the entire function on a circle around the origin with the distribution of the zeros inside that circle. More formally, if f has no zero at zero, then this equation links the zeros in the disk of some radius with the average growth of f on the boundary of the disk. In order to understand the term on the right-hand side of the equation, we introduce the order of growth of a function. Notice that when we have a function with finite order of growth, we can essentially restrict the right-hand side of the equation with a power of r. This is expressed in the fact that the number of zeros with magnitude lower than r is bounded above by a power of the radius. 
For entire functions with finite order of growth, we can refine the wire stress factorization theorem as follows. Instead of having to choose some orders for the elementary factors, these are provided by the order of growth. We also have that the entire function in the exponent must be a polynomial. This is the Hadamard factorization theorem. Let's take a look at our sine function again. To simplify where the zeros are, we are going to analyze this form of the sine. This has simple zeros at all integers. The order of growth of the sine is 1, as you can see with this inequality. So the Hadamard factorization theorem tells us that sine must be of this form. Let's expand the elementary factors. So how do we obtain the two unknown constants? With this limit, we get the value of the second constant. For the other constant, we are going to use that sine is an odd function. The infinite product is even since for every term of a positive integer, there is also a term corresponding to the negative. So we get this. Finally, we get that the constant must be zero. Thus, we get this product formula for the sine. To get the form Euler used, we are going to multiply each term of a positive integer with the term of the negative integer. Another example where we can apply our theorem is the gamma function. The gamma function has no zeros and simple poles at all the integer less or equal to zero. So if we take the reciprocal, we get an entire function which has zeros at the non-positive integers. This has order of growth one. Therefore, we again get an infinite product formula. Let's now look at power series, which do not converge everywhere. For these, there is a radius of convergence and the power series converges inside a disk with this radius. When we scale the variable, we can turn any power series into a power series with radius of convergence one. This gives us a function on the unit disk. Thus, we only have to analyze power series with radius of convergence one. We are going to use more general functions on the unit disk, which are called holomorphic. A function on the unit disk is holomorphic if it can be given as a power series. Notice, however, that the radius of convergence of the power series does not have to be 1. It just has to be greater or equal to 1. First of all, let's look at holomorphic functions on the unit disk, which have no zeros. Just as before, we can rewrite the functions as exponentials of holomorphic functions. For example, the sum of all powers of z is given by this formula. If the function only has finitely many zeros, we can also easily get a factorization. We just separate the function into an exponential part and a polynomial. The situation gets more interesting when we have infinitely many zeros. The zeros again form a discrete set in the unit disk, so they're only countably many and their magnitude must approach one. We can list all of them in order of magnitude. We repeat zeros according to their multiplicity. We could try to factor this again with elementary factors like with entire functions. However, this relied on the fact that the term in the elementary factors would tend to zero. Here this is not the case, as the zeros are bounded. Thus the elementary factors don't approach one, the product can't converge. To understand our functions better, we must understand what happens when we approach the boundary of the unit disk. We can again use Jensen's formula to link the behavior of the functions on some circle with the distribution of the zeros. So the distribution of the zeros in a disk influences the average logarithmic magnitude on the boundary. Zeros closer to the origin have more effect on the average. Just as with entire functions, we can restrict how fast the number of zeros is growing. This time, we bound the integral by a constant. We get that this product is bounded from above. We now take the limit as the radius approaches 1 and then let k tend to infinity. Overall, we get that the product over all norms of the zeros is greater than 0. This tells us how fast the zeros approach the boundary of the disk. We can also express this in the equivalent statement that the following sum converges. This is called the Blaschka condition. It essentially restricts how dense the zeros can be near the boundary of the unit disk. We are now going to try to factor holomorphic functions on the unit disk which satisfy the Blaschka condition. As we already saw, this is not possible with the elementary factors, which we use for entire functions. So which factors are we going to use? We need some holomorphic function on the unit disk, which has exactly one zero at a specified point. As we already saw, the behavior of the magnitude of the function as we approach the boundary reveals much about the function. As these factors should be as simple as possible, 
we might try to find a holomorphic function whose magnitude tends to 1 as we approach the boundary. These two properties are exactly fulfilled by the Blaschka factors. These are automorphisms of the unit disk and have exactly one zero. These factors are exactly what we need to factor the function satisfying the Blaschka condition. Moreover, for any numbers in the unit disk satisfying the Blaschka condition, the product over all Blaschka factors converges and gives us a holomorphic function which has exactly zeros at our specified points. This is called the Blaschka product. Using the Blaschko product, we can, for instance, construct a holomorphic function which has zeros exactly at 1 minus 1 over n squared. Moreover, if we have a function whose zeros satisfy the Blaschko condition, we can factor it into an exponential part and a Blaschko product. The function in the exponent is again holomorphic. When we impose certain growth conditions on our functions, we obtain a more subtle factorization. When we have a holomorphic function on a unit disk, we can split it up into many functions defined on the unit circle, which represent parts with a certain radius. Similar to the LP norms of a function, we can assign a number for each P to our function, which describes how the function grows when we approach the boundary of the circle. Accordingly, we define spaces of functions for which these metrics are finite. These are called Hardy spaces. They are ordered by inclusion, so if the exponent is higher, the restriction on the growth of the function is harsher. Given a function in a Hardy space, what happens when we approach the boundary along a certain angle? It turns out that this limit exists almost everywhere and gives us a function on the unit circle. This radial limit determines the function uniquely in the Hardy space. So if the radial limits agree on some subset of positive Lebesgue measure, then the two functions are the same. In our factorization, we are going to decompose our functions in two. One of them is going to determine the function's behavior on the at the boundary of the circle. This is the outer function. The other function represents the function in the disk and determines the zeros. This is called the inner function. Let's define these terms. An inner function is a function whose radial limit has magnitude 1 almost everywhere. For instance, a Blaschka product is an inner function. An outer function is a function given by this formula. Phi determines the magnitude of the radial limit, and the C rotates the function. Notice that an outer function has no zeros. Now we are ready to state the result that is known as Balling factorization. It says that for a function in a Hardy space, we get a factorization as a product of an inner and outer function. The outer function depends only on the magnitude of F at the boundary. The inner function encodes, among other things, all the information about the zeros through a Blaschko product.